There is but one truly serious philosophical question, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. All the rest, whether or not the world has three dimensions, whether the mind has nine or twelve categories, comes afterwards. These are games. One must first answer. Okay, so welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. And if you're familiar with the writings of Albert Camus, you probably recognize that as the beginning to The Myth of Sisyphus and other essays. And that's the text we're going to be covering in the next few lectures. So, uh, to my left, to your right, is a reading assignment from that book, so 3 to 123, from The Myth of Sisyphus. And I prefaced your notes with, I think, one of the great uh, provocative quotes from Camus, of which he has many, um, all great deeds and all great thoughts have a ridiculous beginning. <laughs> so kind of a deflationary uh, remark, I think, about our hubris and our, and our tendency to exaggerate our own importance and self-importance. At any rate, so uh, the question of suicide is for Camus, uh, the fundamental question subtending all of philosophy, our relation to life and whether life is or is not worth living and under what terms is ultimately the only serious philosophical question. Now, when he poses this kind of provocative statement, it's probably easiest to think of suicide in its most literal form. In other words, the extinguishing of our biological continuity. However, much more commonly, we commit suicide in a figurative kind of way, and he calls that figurative way philosophical suicide. So most of the time in this particular work, he's going to be examining philosophical suicide, although literal suicide is certainly included in, within the purview of his inquiry too. So the question is, what is philosophical suicide? Well, let's look at suicide first in its generality. Uh, for Camus, suicide is a response to the ultimate absurdity of life. It's not so much a response to the fact that life is painful, because the fact is that when things make sense to us, when things are coherent, when we have a sense of purpose or meaning, we can endure quite a bit of suffering, actually. So the question of suicide ultimately isn't so much about suffering, it's more about absurdity, futility, and meaninglessness, because those sorts of factors are what makes suffering unendurable. So suicide is a response to realizing ultimately how absurd and futile and meaningless life actually is. When you're honest about it, normally we're not very honest about that. We cover it over in various ways, which we'll get into probably in 10 minutes or so in this lecture. So what the question at this point is, what is philosophical suicide? Well, philosophical suicide is a way of, as it were, killing off the inquiring and honest part of our minds, the part of our minds that would allow us to recognize exactly how absurd and futile and meaningless life is, a way of sort of shutting that part of our native curiosity down, killing off that part of our perceptual field, as it were. Now, how might we go about doing this, committing philosophical suicide, even if, as we're doing it, we're moving about in the world and our biological continuity is, is happening over years and years? Well, uh, there are any number of ways, but the way that he uh, looks at particularly has to do with belief in God. So, the question is, how is belief in God or believing in God a way of killing off part of our minds and part of our perceptual fields. Well, here's how it works. Basically, uh, we believe in God for two reasons, one of which has to do with our longing for definite answers to the questions that naturally occur to us as human beings. Fundamental questions like, where did the universe come from? Where did we come from? Where are we going, especially after we die? Is there any point to our existence? Those kinds of questions are 
natural enough for human beings because we have a reflective capacity and a cognitive capacity. And so it's a very natural thing for us to wonder about them. But the thing is, when we wonder about them and we look to life itself for answers, life doesn't provide answers to those kinds of questions. Life doesn't tell us where we come from or where the universe came from or where what's going to happen to us after we die or uh, anything like that or whether there's a point to life, etc. Life, we look to life for those kinds of answers and life just meets us with a with a kind of impassive silence and it, it's a very anxiety provoking thing. It's a very uh, strange thing uh, to be met with silence when we voice, at least to ourselves, uh, those kinds of fundamental questions. It's really kind of bizarre when you think about it. When you think about it, it's much easier to tell someone the answer to something of, uh, you know, sort of uh, microscopic significance. Like, for instance, it's very easy to tell someone how to sign on to YouTube, let's say. You know, you just t type in YouTube here, and or you can give the full URL and type it in in this other place and you just hit the return and now you're on YouTube. That kind of very detailed, very small kind of information occurs to us very easily. Like most of us are very fluent in that sort of thing. But the absurdity of our existential predicament is that when it comes to the most fundamental questions, the most basic questions, the ones that subtend all of the particular moments of our lives, all of a sudden it becomes very difficult to say anything substantive and definite about it. And the reason why is because life itself is not giving us anything substantive or definite to say about it doesn't tell us what the point of our lives is. It kind of just, uh, like I said, it kind of meets us with silence and sort of expects us, seemingly, to uh, come up with our own answers to those kinds of questions because it's not providing any answers, at least nothing definite and palpable to us. So philosophical suicide is a response to the absurdity and futility of life by shutting down those kinds of questions especially by providing easy stopgap answers to them. So believing in something uh, performs a kind of psychological function for us because it alleviates our anxiety about how absurd our existential predicament is, that we have these kinds of longings for definite answers, that we really want to know what our lives are about, we would really like to know what the rules of the game are, but life tells us nothing definite about that. And although uh, life is absurd in any number of ways for Camus, this is the most central way that we don't get. The last thing we get is the answers for which we long most for. And so belief in God or any sort of religious structure or any sort of doctrine that would seemingly provide answers to those kinds of fundamental questions is for him a form of philosophical suicide, a way of shutting down the kind of honest recognition that life is not providing us with what we really want, which is answers as to its nature, and in the process is uh, quite absurd, quite ridiculous, quite strange. You know, so <laughs> once again, we're not normally that honest to recognize that, but for Camus, the, the myth of Sisyphus and other essays is really an attempt to be, I guess, one way of seeing it would be an attempt to be more, much more honest than we typically are about the nature of our existential predicament. So believing in God tells us where the universe came from. It was created in seven days and on the seventh day. God rested, or what have you. It depends upon the religion, obviously. I'm giving you a Christian sort of rendition because that's the one I'm most familiar with. Um, uh, it tells us what the point of our lives is, and uh, that is to live according to the edicts of Christian virtue, uh, to be saved and redeemed from our sins along the way. And that is really the whole point of our lives because it's only insofar as that that will meet with one judgment or another, depending upon how that goes. And that's, in an ultimate sense, what our existence is about. It's about a kind of test to see if we can have faith in God and recognize uh, God as the, the center of everything, the ultimate creator, big C creator, the Alpha and the Omega, and so on. And if we pass the test, then we end up in a heavenly afterlife. And if we fail the test in some way, then we end up in 
a hellish kind of afterlife of one sort or another. But the trick, as far as we're talking about now, isn't like about the validity of that. It's more about what it does for us. What believing in the cosmos in that particular way does for us. And for Camus, what it does for us is it shuts down our disquieting anxiety and uncertainty about how ridiculous and how absurd our existential predicament is, particularly because it doesn't provide us with any of the answers for which we really long and which we really want and which would lend our existence and our time here on the earth uh, a sense of definiteness. We're left in uncertainty in a vast, vertiginous, disorienting ocean of uncertainty, especially with respect to the most fundamental questions. So believing in, say, a Christian cosmology, it does, and by the way, it's not just the Christian cosmology. Pretty much every religion has this function. It gives you some kind of narrative about where you came from and where you're going and what the rules of the game are. So if you adhere to a more Buddhist way of thinking, well, you know, it's like you're going through sequences of reincarnations dictated by karma that ultimately, hopefully, will uh, lead you away from the cycle of samsara and into nirvana at some point. And that's sort of the point of things for you to become, to take further steps toward enlightenment throughout this life and throughout your future incarnations, too. If you believe that, well, you know, life is ultimately about being a valiant warrior so that you can... Uh, you know, <laughs> accompany the Valkyries to, to, the, to the halls of Valhalla and hang out with Odin and Wotan and all of those kinds of people, well, same function. It gives you kind of easy stopgap answers for what life does not provide. It provides you with a narrative, a sense of orientation and purpose, and for, but for Camus, at the same time, the cost, the cost of believing in something like that is the cost of killing off a part of yourself the part of yourself that would be direct enough and honest enough to realize that life is not giving you what you want, that is placing you in a fundamentally absurd and precarious situation in simply being human. Okay, now I said earlier that uh, belief in God serves two functions, and we've made note of one of them, which is that it shuts down uh, our uncertainty and our anxiety about not having the answers to <laughs> the riddle of life. Uh, the second function that it serves has to do with justice and our longings for justice. And once again, it's the same sort of arrangement. Most of us have a desire to see people who are good be rewarded for their goodness and to see people who are bad or evil in some sense be punished. We, we long for there to be some justice in the world. But the obvious insight, if you just look at what life itself is telling us, is that, well, sometimes things work out that way. Sometimes good people get rewarded for their good behaviors, and sometimes bad people get punished. But a lot of the time, it works the exact opposite way, that good people sometimes are the ones that end up being beaten up and bloodied first and foremost. A lot of the time, uh, people who are basically uh, criminals and uh, ne'er-do-wells and, and people that you would hope would be punished, a lot of the time they're not punished. A lot of the time they get away with their misdeeds. So if you just look to life for some kind of affirmation of justice, well, it seems like there's a lot of randomness involved in the process. Like maybe you'll, if you're good, you'll be rewarded. Maybe you'll be the first to die. That's the reality of it. If you're bad, maybe you'll be punished and maybe you'll get away with it. And for most of us, there's a certain, once again, a certain irreducible fraction of anxiety that goes with realizing that directly and honestly. And so another function that belief in God or any structure that's sort of like that serves is that it provides us with a narrative that ultimately allows us to think that at the end of the day, good people will be rewarded, bad people will be punished. That's sort of obvious in the Christian account of things because we have heaven and hell and more or less righteous good people go to heaven and unrepentant sinners go to hell. In a Buddhist framework, we have the workings of karma wherein you might be born into the realm of hungry ghosts is one of the, the sort of uh, parts of Tibetan Buddhism. There's six, six 
realms that you could possibly end up in in your next incarnation. And one of them is uh, a realm where you're sort of infinitely hungry, but you have a microscopic mouth to take things in, which sounds like such a painful, awful uh, realm to inhabit. But if your karma is uh, of a certain structure, that's where you'll end up. If you're, uh, I guess, not a valiant warrior from a Nordic point of view, but you're a, a weaselly uh, scoundrel and cutthroat, you will not end up in the halls of Valhalla. I'm not sure where you end up within that framework, but at any rate, it's not anywhere good. The point is that all of these religious ways of seeing life, basically, besides giving us easy answers to all of life's uncertainties, provide us with some sense of justice in the universe, wherein we have a way of thinking about life in terms of good people being rewarded and bad people being punished. Okay, so the, the reason why we commit philosophical suicide is, for the most part, we can't bear the anxiety of all of the uncertainty that attends both life's fundamental questions, and also we can't bear the anxiety of thinking that life basically doesn't care about fairness, but that's more or less the way it is. Like if you look at the natural world, well, you know, uh, you can, it's easy to see scenes of young antelopes being torn apart by hyenas. If you watch a nature special or something like that, and you know, for, for most of us, it seems like just in a, probably a terrible tragedy. Like why would life need to be structured that way where that thing would be happening not just on nature specials that you watch, but it's happening all the time in the natural world. That creatures that, you know, have committed seemingly no transgression or no foul deed end up meeting the most horrific of deaths. Well, the thing is that we're not any different in principle from that. You know, that life will cut you down if you're a good person just as quickly as it'll cut down a bad person. So, that's the nature of philosophical suicide. Now, Camus also gives a name to what we've been calling the absurdity of life, the absurdity of life, and the name he gives is the absurd, okay, with a definite article in front of it. The is a definite article in grammar. So uh, the trick to first getting a handle on the absurd is to realize that it's not just the sensation of absurdity that you feel every now and then, and probably most of us feel it every now and then. Every now and then, you get the sensation that life is just so weird and so bizarre and so nonsensical that it becomes absurd. Well, the thing is, that's a particular experience, but for Camus, the reason why he calls it the absurd is that for him, absurdity is not just something that crops up every now and then in our experience of life. The absurd is something on the order of an ontological category. Okay, so what's an ontological category? An ontological category is a basic structure of being itself. In other words, his insight is that the reason why we sometimes have these experiences of absurdity in our lives is because life is already absurd in principle. And it's only because it's structured that way from the ground up that we can have these sorts of experiences in the first place. When we experience the uh, sensation of absurdity every now and then, what's really happening is we're glimpsing something about how life itself is structured. We're gaining an insight into the the sort of basic, foundational, ground-level way that life already is. So that if you've ever had uh, the sensation that, well, you know, you're really in, in a ludicrous predicament in being alive as a human being, well, for Camus, there's a really good reason for that. And the reason is because that's exactly how life is. That's exactly how it is, and you're only now realizing it. You've somehow uh, torn yourself away from the consensual, uh, self-serving hallucination that life is something just, and life is something coherent, and life is something sensible with a definite point to it. You've torn yourself away from that, and now you're finally seeing the real truth of things. And the real truth of things is that you're in a absurd predicament. You're, you're awash in the absurd, in the ocean of the absurd. So that's what it means for the absurd to be an ontological category. Now, 
Like I said earlier, most of us don't have enough honesty to recognize that directly. Most of us commit philosophical suicide in one form or another. Oh, and by the way, I should mention this, that there are secular ways of committing philosophical suicide too. It's not just that religion serves that function for Camus. It's also that there are secular ways of doing it. For instance, if you are buying into a kind of scientific slash industrial slash technological utopian dream wherein if we just keep pursuing life in a scientific, rational, reasonable way that eventually we'll end up in some sort of utopian state. Well, life doesn't provide any confirmation of that either. In fact, you know, if you look at the history of the last hundred years or so, well, it seems like uh, a lot of that technological know-how and a lot of that rational inquiry into the way reality is structured, we use to, on a fairly regular basis, commit genocide with each other and oppress each other and torment each other. And that rides right alongside all of the wonderful benefits of living in an industrial technological world, too. So the point is that, you know, if you place all your chips on the square of well, eventually, you know, science will yield up some kind of utopian state for humanity. Well, good luck with that, because uh, the jury's definitely out on whether that'll actually happen or not. You know, once again, um, like I said in the last video, as a product of that same dream, we've wired the entire planet for instantaneous nuclear obliteration. How many uh, nuclear armaments are there in the world? Well, the last estimate I read, which is a few years ago, is 13,700 nuclear armaments in the world. And the thing about nuclear armaments is that just one of them can spoil your whole damn day. You know, so when there's 13,700 of them, you're definitely going to have a bad day if, for some reason, they decide to all go off. It'll be Fallout 4, I suppose, and you'll be trying to find your way to Diamond City, perhaps, fending off super mutants and that sort of thing. So, uh, <laughs> that might not be a reference that all of you get, a little bit of gaming reference there. So, uh, at any rate, uh, the question is, uh, at this point, can we do anything other than commit philosophical suicide in one form or another? Actually, you know, sort of side note here, I bet if I had to name the mode of philosophical suicide that's most prevalent in the 21st century when we live, it probably would not be belief in God or anything religious. Probably the most predominant mode of philosophical suicide, I would say, is uh, narcotizing ourselves by way of commodity and entertainment culture. That's the thing we use for the most part that shuts down that sort of honest inquiring part of our minds and our souls. Like for the most part when we begin to feel uh, the anxiety of life and the anxiety surrounding the absurdity of life and how unjust life seems to be a lot of the time, the main thing we do is buy more stuff and try to be happy by way of that. Buy more stuff and be happier. I think that's probably the bigger paradigm even than the religious one that Camus comments on or even the scientific one which I mentioned too. But at any rate, the question is, okay, end of sidebar moment. All right, so the next question is, can we do anything but commit suicide in one form or another? Either literal suicide or philosophical suicide by way of having some kind of belief structure or narrative that shuts down all the uncertainty of life or just relying on sort of science slash industry slash technology to be our default answer that seemingly shuts down all of that stuff. Or on the other hand, narking our, narcotizing ourselves into oblivion to the point where we are unable to recognize how strange and weird and absurd life actually is. Are we bound to commit suicide in one of these ways or another? And his answer is that he doesn't really know, but he holds out the the uh, he holds out the possibility that it may be possible. Now, the kind of person who would be able to do this, in other words, to avoid committing all forms of suicide, he gives a special name to, and the special name is uh, the absurd man. Now. I suppose we could update the, the language of that a little bit, maybe the absurd person or something like that, but I'll stay with absurd man because that's the way it's translated. So the absurd man, what is the business of the absurd man? The absurd man is someone that refuses 
to default to any form of either literal suicide or figurative philosophical suicide and instead keeps the fundamental questions of life unanswered and somehow finds a way to tolerate the probably irreducible fraction of anxiety that that involves and finds a way of moving through life nonetheless. So the absurd man uh, for Camus is uh, a kind of person who is way more honest and way more direct about human existence than we typically are. So here's his description of uh, the absurd man. It's on the notes. Uh, being able to remain on that dizzying crest, that dizzying crest of uncertainty before we've defaulted to some belief system or some mode of uh, tranquilization that our society offers up to us. So let me start again on that. Being able to remain on that dizzying crest, that is integrity and the rest is subterfuge. So su subterfuge, okay, possible vocabulary word like sort of a tricky deception. Maybe that's a way of glossing subterfuge. Like for the most part, we engage in the tricky deception of philosophical suicide. So for him, uh, being able to, to maintain ourselves in a very lucid and direct perception of how absurd life is and yet to find a way of moving through life anyhow, that is really, a, a, for him, like a much more desirable state. Whether we're, anyone's able to do that or not, sort of the jury's out on that and he admits that it's He's not quite certain whether this is really reasonable. But at any rate, uh, for this reason, Camus claims that his uh, philosophical position is that of a thoroughgoing atheism. Now, this seems, uh, to my own point of view, like overstating the claim a little bit. Because uh, the thing about atheism, atheism, of course, is the contention that God does not exist. Well, the thing is that if we're really in this kind of absurd predicament where we don't know any final answers at all, that as he describes it, that doesn't sound like atheism, because atheism seems like a very definite statement about the non-existence of God. But his earlier claim is that, well, part of what makes the absurd the absurd is not that, but rather the uncertainty about all of that. So. Personally, I would say that really what his philosophy amounts to is a form of agnosticism rather than atheism. I think the reason why uh, the French uh, existentialists, not all of them, but uh, fairly often will talk about their work in terms of atheism isn't so much because that's really the logical result of their way of thinking, but rather I think it's a, uh, an expression of a kind of Parisian uh, tendency toward provocation. Like the one of the thing about the French existentialists, or I would say French continental philosophy more generally, is this, uh, th they're sort of pugnacious about things. Like they sort of, they want to put up their dukes and, and uh, you know, defend and advance uh, the most provocative positions possible. And I think the, the claim to atheism is an expression more of that. But in reality, I think that uh, Camus uh, philosophy and also Sartre's philosophy. Sartre claims that his philosophy is irreducibly atheistic too, but really what I think they amount to is two different forms of agnosticism rather than atheism. Incidentally, ag agnosticism is the position that we don't know enough to say whether God exists or not, in case you didn't know that term. Okay, now I wanted to, because uh, this account of Camus' philosophy at this point probably sounds really puzzling. Like, why would anyone want to see the universe or life that way? Like, why would anyone place value on such a difficult, daunting, intimidating life path like that? It can be very difficult, I think, especially at this point, to see like why that might be an attractive position. So, to give you a sense for the other side of things. Okay, so once again, it's obvious that I have not figured out how to make the camera stop its automatic shutoff function. Uh, okay, so what was I saying before I was so rudely interrupted by the camera shutting off? Um, 
What I was saying is that at this point in our account, it can be difficult to see how it is that Camus' position can be an attractive position in some sense. In other words, like lucidly and honestly recognizing how uncertain and how absurd life really is uh, seems scary at first and uh, because it undercuts our reasons for engaging in philosophical suicide and probably a lot of us derive some measure of comfort from our exercises in philosophical suicide. So to sort of uh, unfold a possible answer to that question, uh, in your notes I made mention of another existential psychologist, this one is currently living, uh, Kirk Schneider, and uh, taking an idea from his book called The Rediscovery of Awe, in which he describes what he calls enchanted agnosticism. Okay, so once again, agnosticism is the position that we don't know enough to uh, ascertain whether God exists or not, or probably in a more general sense. Uh, we don't know enough to have definite answers to any of the fundamental questions one way or another that we'd like to have answers to. So uh, the question is, how can agnosticism gain a kind of enchantment for us? How can that be an enchanted position? Well, here's the thing about that. Like when you leave the fundamental questions of life unanswered when you don't defer to any easy ready-made answer whether it's a secular one or a religious one is sort of beside the point it can have a way of allowing life and all the fundamental structures of life be mysterious to us in our experience why because there's no definite easy answer to what's going on well the positive part of that is that life can remain a kind of mystery to us and our engagement with life can be permeated with a sense of mystery to life. Um, and okay, so if everything is mysterious, like how is that um, a positive thing? Well, the thing is when everything is mysterious to us, it can also be in a way uh, magical and miraculous that things are the way they are. Like the sense that, well, the increasing mystery, the increasing sensation of mystery uh, about life can actually be a way of enhancing the miraculous nature of life. Why? Because when you have like easy lock dead answers, one of the negative effects of that, although it helps us with our anxiety, but one of the negative effects of that is that it can shut down the miraculous nature of things. Why? Because there's like an easy, direct, obvious answer. Well, great, but like, wouldn't you rather live in sort of a powerful, magical, mysterious universe? And I don't know, my, my answer personally would be, yeah, I'd rather experience life as an ongoing unfolding of the miraculous. And if the price for that is learning to endure a certain fraction of anxiety and learning to be a little bit more direct and honest about how weird life is and how absurd it is and how many of our questions remain unanswered, well, so be it. Like, which would you rather have? Like, would you rather feel sort of safer and uh, less anxious and at the same time have less of a sense of the magicality of life? Or are you willing to pay a kind of price at the level of anxiety and at the level of uncertainty so that you can gain a more magical sense for what life is about. And, you know, it's a really personal question, uh, but I think that ultimately that's what Camus is getting at. He's inviting us to celebrate, ultimately, life's absurdity, like to, to have enough strength in who and what we are, spiritually uh, and otherwise, existentially, so that we can, we can learn to tolerate reality, that we don't have to run from reality into any narrative, like any deflection from what life is actually showing us. It's possible for us to have direct and honest confrontation with what life is and to feel perhaps some temptation to run from it into one form of philosophical suicide or another, but yet at the same time to decide that we're not going to do that. And who knows, perhaps life would be lived all the better if we were to cleave to reality as faithfully and as powerfully as we possibly can. So that's probably enough to get you going on Camus. Uh, the next video in the series will also be about 
the same work. It's going to take us several videos to get there. But until then, have a great day and uh, enjoy, <laughs> enjoy the corona apocalypse as much as you can. Take care. Bye-bye.